Philemon have been laying out for us the priorities, practices, principles of the church in Colossae. Its values, its, its, its DNA. I hadn't thought to say that, but I think that's what I mean. What matters to it, what makes it what it is, what makes it function the way it does in the plans and purposes of God. That church located in Colossae, meeting in Philemon's home around 600 AD. So how did they roll? Apostolic teams, big emphasis. Shared ministry, as ministry grew around the edge of the apostolic team, it was like a rolling rock, people peeling off and making runs in other directions strategically. House churches, because having a church building is weird. It's a new perspective, isn't it? Some young church planter type bloke elsewhere Facebook me having listened to the message time before last, and he said, oh, so it can be okay not to have a building. Perhaps it's not such a problem to us. No, it was the biblical norm. House church is saturated, conditioned by grace. Conditioned by grace. Saturated with grace. Making our responses to one another and to the people outside of here on the basis of the way grace works. Work right through. And now what Paul is doing is he's picking up what that impacted by Christ thing means. Paul has gone on and he's picked up in verses 6, 5, 6, 7, isn't it? How, how Philemon and his life and the way he's behaving, how that indicates that he has been impacted by grace. The impact that God's grace has had on Philemon. You're doing this, he says. That shows the impact that God's grace on you. Impacts that further characterise the practice of the early church that indicate the genuineness and reality of the Christian faith and experience. Because the impact of grace on this church brings out things in us, love, grace, mercy, tenderness, compassion, bring out things that make it clear to people who are watching that God is for real. So we go the easy route far too often and we say, well, God is for real and this is why the New Testament documents are reliable and God is for real and this is the evidence for the resurrection. And actually, what Paul is saying about the church in Colossae that meets in Philemon's home is the, the evidence for the grace of God is seen in what you're like. The way God has changed you. The way the grace of God now runs right through you like the letters through the stick of rock. Paul doesn't know that because he was never blessed with the stick of rock. But, <laughs> but you get the general impression, right? It's the impact of God's gospel on God's people that is the evidence that God is for real and that love, love is the evidence that we're his disciples, says Jesus. As we saw last time, we've done all this in previous weeks. Please refer to the resources on the internet. Right, okay, so love for all God's people, faith in the Lord Jesus, joy and encouragement created by those things, by the way that hospitality and refreshing the hearts of the saints expresses the impact of the grace of God on human life. Christian community, the evidence of the grace of God. I got this last week from a young man who watched a sermon extract from last week, why don't young people go to church, want to go to church. Here's the quote, ready? Hey Simon, this is the way young people talk to them on the way to leave. Hey Simon, pastor, we would say pastor, could I have a word, wouldn't we? Yeah, like that. But no, hey Simon, that's fine. I listened to your sermon on why, you don't, why wouldn't young folk go to church. Interesting stuff, really good points. I think you're really onto something with people seeing that it's real. See, perhaps in our generation, perhaps a little later, people wanted slick presentation, they wanted thorough, whatever, right? They wanted to look right. And now you look at all the videos they point out and they're all grainy and gritty and sharp cuts and, you know, nothing fades or goes nicely. It's all real, authentic. People want real. I think what many people around me think is a system which says things which sound right and middle class, and any scandal that has arisen is swept under and everyone carries on. It's not a sentence, but that's usual with young people these days anyway, Grizzlebird. I find this especially in prayer. And myself too. The reality in relating to what he's saying. Why do I use different lingo when speaking to God? I can't believe that you do. But <laughs> There is now, he says, a deep scepticism of falsehood. And I think that a real love for each other is a way to show past that. Thanks again for the word. Great way to start a Monday. Bless you too. 
I see you loved. Yeah. Real. The love, the compassion, the care, the community. So now in verses 8 to 22, Paul wants to put that community in action. Let's see it again, he says. So now in verses 8 to, 8 to 22, and we're starting the first half of that today, what does he want? He's asking for something. He wants Philemon to receive his runaway slave Onesimus, runaway slave, who is returning to Colossae with this letter and the epistle to the Colossians. Here is Onesimus's act of repentance. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. He wants him to receive him back as a brother and forgive his offence because he wants to see grace meet repentance. And then he says, and by the way, could you possibly send him back to me? Because I've got use for him. Can I have your slave, please? I wouldn't ask for your car. Well, I wouldn't ask for your car. Yeah. But, but <laughs> I wouldn't ask for your car. I wouldn't ask to borrow a bike off you because I'm not like that. Right? But Paul, sorry. Paul is going to Philemon and he's saying, I want your slave off you. Come out. Paul is finding himself a bit limited because Paul is trying to evangelize the whole of the city of Rome from a prison cell. And that's not easy, is it? I could do with an Esimus. Any chance of an Esimus back? Now, the first part of this main body of the letter, verses 8 to 16, it seems to be mainly concerned with talking about the relationship between God and Philemon to back up that request, which then naturally leads into the bit about the relationship between Paul and Philemon from verses 17 onwards. But the main body of the letter is this dirty great lump of verses. And it's just, the only way we can kind of separate it out a bit to make it last two weeks, is, is that verses 8 to 16 is, is basically, roughly, around the relationship between God and Philemon. And then that leads naturally to the bit about the relationship between Paul and Philemon. And these two things, your relationship with God, my relationship with you, these are the things that should lead you to St. Philemon. He's asking for something. The preacher is asking for something. This is dangerous territory, is it not? We don't like to go there. And Paul just walks straight in. It's fine. There's grace in the place. There's grace in the place. So Paul is going to make an appeal to Philemon for Philemon to do something with Anesimus that is utterly countercultural, utterly against what is in his interest to do. Utterly what he doesn't want to do. And he's going to ask you to do that because grace works. And because it's hit you, Volume. And you're a changed man. How about this? And Paul says, and this is also really difficult to take. Paul says, I've got the right to command you to do this. Hey? What are you talking about, preacher? That is what Paul says. But he says, instead of that, I, I don't want to command it, I want to commend it to you. Mm -hmm. right? I want to commend it to you as a direction in which the grace of God, so evidently you work in your life, Philemon, will no doubt lead you. Because this will be consistent with grace. It's all about laying aside behaviour motivated from the outside inwards, I can command you, that's the way mankind works. In favour of countercultural, self sacrificial life change from the inside out, which is the way the gospel of God's grace works. Impacts, revolutionises the way we live human life. And I'll try to give you a summary at the start, just going to have to work through it bit by bit on the text itself, just commenting briefly and see what conclusions we draw from it. But that's what's going on here, can you see that? The basis of Paul's appeal then, verse 8 of Philemon. Therefore, this is oh, wild, who preached this? Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. What's going on? It's difficult stuff. See, there is an embarrassing amount in the Bible about the authority of those who minister God's word to a congregation. It's embarrassing. I find it embarrassing. I find it awkward to do that. And Paul's doing nothing unique here when he refers to his authority to order Philemon to do the right thing with Onesimus. 
Hebrews have got a famous passage about it, Hebrews 13, 17. Have confidence in your leaders. This is a good one. So, you know, pastors would last a lot longer if, if only we could have confidence in them. Now, sometimes they act in a way, right? That means, <laughs> right, you can't have confidence. But, but he said, look, try and have confidence. Try and have confidence in your leaders. And this is the really dodgy bit. Submit to their authority. That is dangerous, scary. Some of us have known situations in, in our lives where, you know, people leading churches, haven't been leading them. They've been hitting them with a big stick. I'm in charge here. Blah, 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 blah. Right now, there's all sorts in the Bible about that. About how you must never dare to lord it over the flock, which isn't yours, but God's. Yeah? But he is Hebrews. Have confidence in your leaders, submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. And there's a scary thought for the guy who should be doing that, because he's going to have to stand in front of God, and God's going to say, why didn't you stop that happening? How scary is that? Up and down Wales, up and down the UK, churches, situations you see develop, and you think, oh, pastor, you should have done something about that a long time ago. Why? Why did you let that go? Why didn't you man up and just face it? The church is going to split, if it's going to go early, you should have manned up to that one. Look at the damage that's been caused because you didn't put a stop to that. God's going to stand there and he's going to say, why didn't you do the that? Submit to them because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. They are accountable for that. Do this so that their joy, work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no benefit to you. There is this mentality actually, isn't there? That you've got to keep your, your leaders humble. Make sure what car they are, I'm not driving, make sure, I'm not here, it doesn't look like that here, because we haven't got that set up. But, um, I hope we've got that set up, why are you looking at me like that? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, don't, don't pay him that much. It's wicked for a pastor to have that much. I was with a young minister this week, I gave him an hour or so, give some exam. <clears throat> he was earning a proper salary. But it would be easy to turn around and say, yeah. Easy. We've got that mentality that the ministry should be a burden and we should make it that. That's Wales. That's not here. Don't think relax. But that is Wales. We should make sure it is. Because otherwise it won't be sufficiently godly. Let's, let's, just, let's just knock that on the head. It's as if the biblical author has got absolutely no compunction at all in saying this. This is the nature of the relationship. This is the way it should be. And you've got some very severe things to say to people who are in positions of leadership as well, by the way. It's a very balanced picture. But here is Paul, as he speaks to this wealthy, socially significant, generous host to benefactor of the Church of Colossae. I could order you to do this, because that's what you want to do. But I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. How about this? No fall into worldly wealth or prestige here from the emperors who are the Christ's prisoner in Rome. He doesn't think of himself as sort of the bottom of the pile, does he? Locked up in a jail somewhere. I'm, I'm Christ's prisoner, you know, I'm not in your own, right? And this is what you get from him as a result. I could just say, do it, says Paul. But look, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. And you'll go on to describe where that should come from. That love and that action. you go on to describe where it should come from, both in terms of um, reflection, really, on, on Paul's sacrifice for the gospel, and in terms of Paul's having brought the gospel powerfully under God in Philemon's own life. You owe me your life, he says. Well, of course he does, you know, he looks like Philemon on one of his trips down to Colossae, met with Paul, perhaps in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, you know. And he did the gospel and he, he came alive in Christ. <coughs> you have a responsibility, I've taught you the gospel, he says. The issue though is that, that Paul is, is trying to get Philemon to live counterculturally, trying to get Philemon to live self sacrificially for Christ, not from any sense of compulsion. But out of gratitude to God, both for what God has done in Philemon's life and for what God has done in the life of this previously unprofitable, thieving, runaway slave that Paul is sending back to. Isn't God great? That's something gracious. 
Did you notice the word I've left out? It's the word therefore. And when you see a therefore, you always ask, What's it there for? What's it there for? Yeah. yeah. And what's it there for? Verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold in all duty, therefore, what's it there for? It's there because of verses 5 to 7, which demonstrate the reality of grace in Philemon's life, which has had evidence for it in the way that Philemon has behaved. Because of that, because of that, I appeal to you. I know you're the real thing, man. I know you're the real thing. Come on. Let's do the real thing. Yeah? What an honor for Philemon. To be asked. Because he's the real thing. Man, I know you're the real thing. Come on. Let's do something gracious. Now, this is important. Because we, we, we tend to think, um, perhaps, I say perhaps, um, that it's great to be something powerful. It's great to be something exciting. Something we're expectant about. One of my friends on Twitter keeps, keeps putting in the hashtag expectant. And he's, he's a male. And this week, I saw a, a female Christian lady also picked it up and she put expectant and I nearly choked. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> We've got to be all excited and dynamic. Hang on. Let's be gracious. Let's be something gracious. Let's be something gracious. The basis of Paul's appeal, then the power of Paul's appeal, verse 9. Paul appeals personally to this guy. I appeal to you as Paul, he says. You know me. He says, Paul speaking. You know, fill in the gaps, fill in the, fill in the love, fill in the attention, fill in the dedication, fill in the discipling work that's going on. Hey, it's me, it's Paul. Come on, I'm asking you. You can't do that as a pastor. You can't do that. Paul is trading on the relationship between him and this disciple of Christ that he's brought to be a disciple of Christ and helped along the way. And he's saying, come on, I'll tell you a story. Shall I mention that name? Yeah, I will. I, I don't care. He did the same for me. Gareth Crossley. You know Gareth Crossley. I'm sitting, I've had a, I'm a young minister. I've had a really hard time. God is blessed, but I've been run ragged by some really genuinely caring some people who are, who are not regular churchgoers to start with. And uh, they've come to Christ. This is years ago. And my ex has been a bit done in by all this. And I've phoned Gareth because Gareth's got a degree in counselling. And I said, Gareth, come here to the box. Right? Can, can we have a chat? Yep, yeah, come and see me. Come and see me. Get in the car. What do you mean? Go down. What do you mean? It's lunchtime. Go down. Okay, fine. Where are we going? I've got money for lunch. What are you talking about? So he said, nice, fine. So we went there. And we met in this little restaurant place. And we had, it's very nice. We had this nice bowl of soup and bit of bread and cheese. And yeah, it's nice. Good lunch. Got tea. And he said, see those guys over there? I said, yeah. He said, they are a businessman in my church. I said, oh, great. He said, uh, they're going to pay for our dinner. I said, what? He said, watch. So in five minutes, they got up and came over and we were chatting and chatting. And uh, Gareth said, uh, my brother is also a Christian minister. Oh, great, great. Excellent. Nice to meet you. And we got up to leave. We got up to leave. We haven't paid. I said, Gareth. He said, it's covered. How do you know it's covered? What do you mean it's covered? He didn't have to appeal. He didn't even need to go there. He was done. Because to these guys, he was like a scratch of the dog, you know, did nothing. He can't do that. Paul says, I'm doing it. <laughs> like, it blows my mind away. You know I'm having to work hard at the moment to try and set up projects and make things happen and sustain everything, yeah? I have to go and I have to ask people for things. Do I like asking people for things? But Paul is asking this guy because he says, look, it just goes to show the grace of God and its impact on human life. And we're actually giving a demonstration of gospel grace here. This is what grace does. And we've seen some of that ourselves. 